Okay, uh, so uh, as said, I'm Joseph Bonneau, but uh, I'll be presenting uh, joint work uh, with my student. Those of you with an academic background know that joint work means uh, the student did all the work and I'm here to uh, talk about it. Um, but uh, really, I'd, I'd like to uh, explain what a succinct blockchain is, if it's not a concept you've uh, heard before. Um, and I'll uh, try to get to our research, which is on doing a succinct blockchain with proof of work, in which case we call it necessary proof of work. So uh, succinct blockchains are uh, really all about the cost of uh, catching up, joining the network late, and trying to verify everything that's happened in the blockchain while, uh, while you weren't paying attention. Uh, and if any of you have ever uh, tried to sync uh, a full node to the Bitcoin network, um, you know that it, it's a very bandwidth-intensive process. You have to download uh, hundreds of gigabytes of old blocks. And it's also CPU-intensive. Once you have all those blocks, you have to verify um, lots and lots of signatures. And depending on your computer, this is uh, just the CPU part can take uh, many hours or days. Uh, so it's very difficult. This problem's only getting worse. Blockchains uh, are growing. Um, and of course, the more they grow, the more difficult it will be for clients in the future uh, who join the network to actually verify everything that's happened up to that point. So uh, as a result, most clients don't actually do this. Um, most clients uh, run a light client, which means they only verify the headers. Um, even that requires uh, you know, a not always totally trivial amount of bandwidth to download all the headers in the network. Um, and that's also growing. So some clients go even one step further than that, uh, sometimes called ultralight clients, but have a lot of different names. They just query a trusted server uh, who will tell them what the most recent block is, and they'll simply believe it. So you can kind of see going left to right, uh, if you're willing to make more trust assumptions, not verify everything yourself, you can save a lot of that bandwidth and that CPU cost. But of course, if you're running an ultralight client, uh, you're totally at the mercy of whoever has told you what the most recent block is, uh, that, they aren't, uh, that they aren't defrauding you. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we could get the security guarantees uh, of running a full client, which uh, really just means you have to talk to somebody who can, uh, uh, who's honest. Um, it doesn't actually matter how many uh, dishonest um, servers you may talk to. As long as at least one is honest, you'll be able to, to tell who it is. So we'd like that security guarantee, um, but obviously without this uh, relatively large cost, which is uh, you know, too much for lots of classes of clients that we'd like to enable. Certainly uh, doing this all on a phone, not practical today. So there have been a couple of projects that have tried to uh, speed up verification in uh, different pieces. It's kind of interesting. There's two branches of this research. One has focused just on improving uh, the speed of transaction verification. Uh, another work has focused just on speeding up uh, verifying all of the proof of work that has happened. Um, this talk today, we're going to do both of these things. So it's kind of uh, exciting. Succinct blockchains you know, do, uh, are really the only solution that does uh, both things. Um, okay, so where does this idea of a succinct blockchain come from? Um, it comes from this observation that uh, doing all this blockchain verification work is sort of wasteful because every client in the world is doing the exact same work. They're all downloading the same blocks. They're all verifying all the same signatures. Um, so lots and lots of uh, clients around the world in kind of the, the classic model of uh, Bitcoin or similar cryptocurrencies are meant uh, to repeat the same work. Um, there's this idea of verifiable computation, which is uh, suitable you know, exactly for this kind of situation where lots and lots of clients uh, want to do the same work. Uh, and the idea um, is instead of having uh, lots of clients repeat the work, um, you know, we express the work formally, we express it as an NP statement, but you can think of it uh, as a, uh, a program that takes some input um, we use a verifiable computation uh, protocol for a prover who doesn't have to be trusted to actually uh, evaluate that uh, program on that input and provide a proof that the result is correct. So that's really the, where the, the heavy lifting comes in from crypto, the fact um, that you can provide a proof for any NP statement, um, which is a really, really powerful theoretical result. Uh, and in fact, that proof is transferable. So if lots of verifiers are interested in uh, the same program on the same input, 
the approver only has to do the work once to run that program and compute a proof. Uh, and then every other verifier in the world, every other uh, computer that's interested in that program doesn't have to re-execute the computation themselves. They just have to verify this proof. Uh, and you know, essential to verifiable computation is that verifying the proof is a lot easier than uh, doing the work yourself. Uh, you can sort of get rid of this repeated work problem. So if you kind of squint at this, uh, you realize it, it looks a little bit like the blockchain problem I was just describing to you. Um, you know, we can describe this uh, program, uh, and if we could just have a proof that the blockchain was correct, then all these clients wouldn't have to execute that uh, long program themselves. They could just look at the proof. Um, so more specifically, um, you know, the fact that a blockchain is valid is an NP statement. What does it mean for a blockchain to be valid? Uh, well, um, it has to chain back to the genesis block. It has to have all valid transactions. Um, it has to have a certain amount of uh, aggregated work. Um, and uh, these are, uh, you know, all the standard properties that you would check. Um, and this can all be essentially compiled into a, um, a statement that we can provide a proof over. Um, and we can actually do uh, kind of one better than just, uh, you know, the, the problem with this formulation is that every time you add a block, the statement would change and you would have to recompute the proof from scratch. Um, so there's kind of a standard trick, which is very nice. Uh, we can actually, uh, instead of expressing this as a statement about an entire chain, we can express it as a statement about an individual block. Um, and we can add to that statement that the previous block has its own proof of validity or is a genesis block, that's kind of the, the base case. Um, and we have this kind of uh, recursive uh, proof that chains all the way back to the genesis block that every block in the chain is correct. Okay, so um, instead of just having one statement about the whole chain, we have a proof for every individual block, and part of that proof is that uh, the previous block had a valid proof. Um, the reason we do this, of course, is that now uh, adding a block to the end of the chain very, very efficient, we, well, relatively efficient. We just have to uh, add one extra uh, proof that the most recent block is efficient. Uh, okay, but the, the beauty of this is that these proofs are all constant size and you only have to verify the last proof in the chain. Um, so anybody can give you a block um, and you can sort of instantly or near instantly verify the proof in the block that tells you exactly how much proof of work was done uh, to get to that point and that uh, all the transactions are valid and everything else is valid according to, you know, really whatever rules uh, for your blockchain you want. Uh, so the security model, now if you're a verifier who wants to join the network and you don't know anything, uh, all you need is to talk to uh, one honest prover who knows the actual most recent block in the chain. Uh, they'll give you uh, what they think the most recent block is plus a proof. Um, and even if there's some dishonest prover who's trying to convince you that some uh, fork of the chain uh, is actually canonical, um, you can verify both proofs. Um, and you just have to check the amount of proof of work, uh, which is committed to in the proof and, and uh, verified by the proof, and you'll instantly know what the longest chain is. Okay, so um, you just get the most recent, the claimed most recent block from these two parties, or really you could add as many other uh, dishonest parties as you want. Uh, and when you verify the proof, you'll, uh, you'll know what the actual longest chain is or the, the chain with the most work. Uh, okay, so that was kind of a, a high level overview of, of what a succinct blockchain is. The, uh, you know, the, the upshot of this, the benefit, um, depends on what uh, proof system you use. I'll give you some numbers from a prototype implementation we have. Um, but now you can join the network, you download less than a kilobyte of proof, um, very, very quick to verify, and you can be convinced that the entire chain leading up to it is correct. Uh, so hopefully, like I promised, you can get the same trust model as running a full node. You're okay as long as you connect to some honest node in the network, um, but with uh, you know, very, very low bandwidth and, and CPU costs. Uh, so we've... Uh, done an implementation in my lab. I said the proofs were less than a kilobyte. They're actually much, le much less than a kilobyte uh, using LibSnark. Um, they're quick to verify. Um, notice it uh, 
for a verifier, um, 50 milliseconds to verify uh, essentially an entire blockchain that can be as long as you want it to be, could be the entire 10-year history of Bitcoin. Uh, so that's great. Um, the one uh, catch here, which is kind of you know, true in most, uh, most systems using verifiable computation, the time to compute that proof is not zero. Okay, so uh, to add one block, and this is a block with just 25 transactions, so it's still kind of a small research prototype. Um, in our current implementation, it takes uh, about two and a half minutes to compute a proof that uh, that block is correct. Okay, so it's not uh, astronomical, but it's not uh, very efficient either. Um, and I should add, there's a, a lot of caveats here. This is a very stripped down system that only does payments and doesn't have uh, most of the complexity of, of Bitcoin. Uh, but this is kind of just to show you that uh, it's possible, you know, most of these restrictions could be kind of eaten away at uh, over time. Uh, okay, so um, like I said, computing these proofs, fairly expensive. So really the, the key question is who's going to compute those proofs? And again, you know, only one party needs to compute them and then uh, everybody in the world who wants to join the system can verify them cheaply. Uh, but somebody has to eat that cost of computing this proof that takes uh, several minutes. It might, might take, of course, much longer than that if you want to hire uh, higher throughput than 25 transactions every two and a half minutes, right? Um, so uh, you may have heard of uh, Coda, which I should uh, you know, disclose. I'm an advisor to the Coda project. I'm not talking about Coda today. I'm talking about the, you know, the NYU research prototype. Coda is also building a succinct blockchain. Um, and in uh, CODA's implementation, the consensus protocol is proof of stake. So the validators uh, that are running the proof of stake protocol, it's their responsibility uh, to compute these proofs that each block is correct. Um, whereas the approach that we've been exploring on the academic side uh, basically asks the question, what if we wanted to do a succinct blockchain using a proof of work consensus model? Okay, and uh, we'd like the uh, participants in this uh, proof of work consensus protocol to be the ones computing the proof. Um, so this is really, uh, you can think everything I've set up to now about succinct blockchains is kind of a, you know, a general framework that multiple people are interested in. Um, and this specific question of how we can do a succinct blockchain using proof of work consensus uh, is what my student and I have been you know, in particular working on. Okay, so um, you know if, uh, if you followed me so far, if you had a minute to think about it, the straw man that you would probably come up with um, is to say, why not have uh, the miners, every miner who finds a block, it's their responsibility to compute a, pr a proof that uh, the block is correct, and uh, you know, the network simply won't accept a block that doesn't have a proof of correctness. Right, you can just say, push this problem onto the miners, they're doing a lot of work anyway. Um, and then, of course, they'll you know, broadcast this to everybody else. And if the proof is uh, valid, then other miners will accept the block. OK. Um, so uh, the reason that this doesn't work, um, the, the technical reason it doesn't work is that it means that uh, the process of mining is no longer progress free. Um, and I actually think that the technical definition, there's a lot of different ways to state this technically. Um, but Conceptually, what you want is fairness between large and small miners. So if a miner uh, has twice as many resources dedicated to mining in a proof-of-work protocol, you'd like them to find twice as many blocks and get twice as many rewards, but not more or less than, uh, than two times. Right? If they got uh, three times as much rewards for twice as much effort, the system would be unstable. It would tend towards centralization because uh, you know, uh, there'd be a returns to scale for large miners. Uh, so why does this uh, happen if we require miners to compute a proof after they find a proof of work solution? Um, well, you'd have some distribution uh, that would vary between large and small miners for how long it took them to solve the proof of work puzzle, right? Um, so it would take you know, longer on average for a smaller miner to solve the proof of work puzzle, but sometimes they would solve it first. Uh, in fact, you know, if we assume the small miner is half the size of the large miner, they should find a proof of work solution first about a third of the time, which is balanced, that's what we want. Um, but then imagine 
that you add this extra step, which is that they have to generate a proof of correctness for the succinct blockchain. Um, and imagine that the large miners, since they have more resources, can compute that proof more quickly, right? So now you've basically uh, shifted the distribution of how long it takes these two parties to find a block, and the large miner um, is going to find many more than two thirds uh, of the blocks, right? So they're going to have what you know we. Uh, I hope everybody in this room would agree is an unfair advantage. Okay, so you know the fact that the time to generate a proof is uh, going to be constant, the, the large miner will always be able to generate a proof faster, makes this sort of unfair. Um, and how unfair it is, you could think about quantifying in terms of the ratio between uh, how long it takes to do the, uh, the solve the proof of work puzzle and how long it takes to generate the proof. Okay? So um, if you know, the uh, proving time is short relative to the puzzle solving time, it's uh, you know, kind of almost progress free, not that unfair. But this is only going to happen if the rate of blockchain updates is really, really slow. OK, because generating that proof is kind of uh, a constant. And we'd like to make it as short as possible. But with current technology, we can't get it under on the order of minutes. Uh, and if we go in the other direction, if generating the proof takes a really long time you know, relative to finding the nonce, then uh, it starts to get really unfair. And in the limit, um, you know, the, the single fastest prover would find every single block, because that would actually be the, the bottleneck to finding blocks. OK, so this kind of doesn't look very good. I'm telling you that there's a choice between either a lot of unfairness, the largest miner uh, in the protocol you know, finding every block, or requiring the time between blocks to be very, very long to make this problem go away. Um, so uh, the solution that we came up with, which uh, is uh, you know, I, I think quite, uh, quite interesting, um, is that you actually make generating the proofs the puzzle itself. OK? Um, so the miners are meant to run in a loop where they generate a proof of correctness for a, a putative block. And then they actually hash the proof, OK? They hash the proof that the block is correct and check that against the difficulty target. Uh, so the, the sort of beauty of this is that as soon as they've found uh, a block which satisfies this condition, by definition, they have a proof since they were hashing the proof to check against the difficulty target. Um, the difficulty now uh, is that you have to worry about being able to amortize work between proofs, OK? So uh, what would happen if a miner found one proof that didn't satisfy the difficulty condition, but they were able to, in less time than finding another proof, uh, tweak it to find a different proof that was still valid but had a different hash? And they might do that by, say, just changing the nonce. Um, and it's possible to regenerate the proof without redoing all of the work. You can sort of just redo uh, parts of the proof. Um, and similarly, you could just change one transaction. There's a lot of ways to tweak a proof to get you know, a proof of a slightly different statement that's also valid. Um, and uh, you know, if, uh, if you have this problem, we basically end up with the same problem where we have a not progress-free uh, part, which would be generating a first proof and then grinding over tweaks to actually find one that's valid. So this is. You know, basically the same Im image I showed you a few slides ago, except reverse. Now the constant part happens first, you know, finding a first proof, and then you grind. Um, so uh, the, just to give you a very small taste of the you know, theoretical work we're doing, um, we had to define this new property of proving systems called amortization resistance, which basically states that it's not possible to compute multiple proofs in much less time um, then, you know, a multiple of the number of proofs you want times the time to compute one proof. Um, and the trick to doing that uh, is that we take um, a pseudo-random value, which is based on a hash of the final state after uh, applying all the transactions in that block. And then uh, the circuit for the statement you're proving, we have to actually modify so it depends heavily on this seed. Um, and more specifically, since uh, most uh, most of the work in proving is actually evaluating a hash function over and over again. Um, and we use a, a hash function with some algebraic structure, which is kind of interesting. We can actually uh, tweak that hash function using this pseudo-random seed um, to require that uh, for any two blocks, 
almost all of the uh, pieces of the proof change. Um, okay, so since I'm almost out of time, I just want to leave you with um, kind of a, you know, some uh, questions about what we could do in the limits here. Uh, you know, for perfect efficiency, it would be great if nobody in the system ever repeated any work. Uh, if we had sort of a perfect verifiable computation system where everything was provable uh, for free, there was no proof overhead time, and proofs were sort of instantly fast to verify, um, then we could get that, which would be sort of interesting. Um, in the meantime, I think it's interesting to think for any system um, about efficiency in terms of how much work uh, the whole system is doing, including you know, all the miners uh, and all of the uh, participants in the system who have to actually sync clients and uh, verify the blockchain. Um, so think about the amount of work that's actually being done over sort of the minimum amount if you had perfect verifiable computation, which means uh, as soon as anybody has done any work, they can prove it to anybody else so nobody ever needs to repeat work. Um, so, you know, if you think about it this way, hopefully we're sort of, uh, hopefully this work um, is kind of a, a step down the path of getting closer to sort of a, a perfect efficiency, uh, well, a system with perfect efficiency. Um, so I believe uh, I'm out for time. Do I have time to take questions or are we, okay, I can take one question I'm told, yeah. Bitcoin anti-scales, the okay. more participants, the worse the efficiency is. Does this uh, scale or anti-scale do you? The more participants, the worse the efficiency is. Uh, what do you mean by participants? You mean people submitting transactions? The more hash or? power there is in the, in the system. Uh, and is less efficient how? Uh, you're computing, you're using more energy to compute the same number of blocks. Oh, uh, well, you know, this is, sort of still fundamentally proof of work, so you know, there will still be waste from proof of work in this system, uh, or at least like people will compute. Uh, I should probably take your question offline because we have some sort of, uh, the way I, I presented it, there's still a lot of proofs that are thrown out since they don't meet this difficulty target, um, but we do have some ways to actually sort of recover those and, and try and gain, uh, gain that work back. Um, so, you know, my claim would be kind of strictly more efficient than uh, Bitcoin today, um, but yeah, not, not perfectly efficient. Oh, and I should say, uh, if you're interested in the details, uh, we're hoping to put our uh, paper online soon, but I'd be happy to, to share it if you email me or email Aki, the, the student who's uh, writing the paper. <laughs>